it's 11 o'clock on a Sunday morning and it's time for Chai and Y. Hello and welcome to the last Chai and Y of 2020 and our last probably only online Chai and Y. As you know, Chai and Y happens, you know, sometimes three times a month, but certainly on the first and third Sundays, if not the fifth. And this year for a long part, we've been forced to be online due to the coronavirus pandemic. But the good news is that from next year, from January, we will be back at Prithvi Theater at least on the first Sunday of the month. But we will be online as well. So for those who have got used to watching us online and still don't want to travel or are not in Mumbai and are joining in, this is good news for you. You can tune in to our online sessions. We will be there online as well. And to begin 2021, we're going to have a session on you measure, therefore you conclude on the importance of measurements in science by Satyanarana uh, from the India-based Neutrino Observatory Group at TIFR. So that should be a fun talk to get uh, 2021 started off with. Uh, but before that, there's a lot of exciting things happening just around us right now. And in fact, today and tomorrow, you must look outside and take a look at the sky after sunset towards the southwest, almost westish. You will see Jupiter and Saturn almost together. In fact, tonight and tomorrow night, they're going to be at their closest they've been in the last 400 or so years. And they will not come so close until 2080. So they are much, much closer than about, you know, uh, almost at the limit of being able to be separate them with the naked eye. And if case you have access to binoculars or telescopes, you will actually see Saturn and Jupiter in the same field of view. And with even a small telescope, you should be able to see the moons of um, uh, Jupiter and the rings of Saturn, etc. But even if you can't, you don't need anything but your eyes, just go and see. Can you even see Jupiter and Saturn as two individual objects? Or are they so close that you can't make them out uh, together? This happens only for about a half an hour after sunset. So uh, don't, don't miss it. It's uh, somewhere today and tomorrow is where they'll be at their close together. Um, of course, the next week has National Mathematics Day on 22nd December, which is also giving us a theme for our session today, which has a little maths focus to it. And uh, during the week, there's another talk which might be interesting for the public. Uh, this is a part of our, the Homi Bhabha Center for Science Education's initiative on undergraduate science. Uh, this is on ultra low temperatures and what you can do at these low temperatures. Uh, to be given by our director, uh, Professor Ram Krishnan. And this will be on YouTube. And don't worry, we will put out the links on uh, our web pages and Facebook, et cetera, uh, in the next uh, day or so. And remember, the best way to find out about Chai and Y is to uh, follow us on Facebook or Twitter. It's at Chai and Y. You can ask questions. You can uh, you know, engage with us, suggest things you'd like to talk about, hear about. And uh, to keep following us. And with that, it's probably time to introduce uh, uh, today's speaker and the topic. Uh, we have Ram Prasad Saptarshi, who's a faculty member in the School of Technology and Sciences at TIFR. And for all his life, he's been interested in puzzles. Puzzles, right from simple you know, pen and paper puzzles to the Rubik's Cube and fancy versions of the Rubik's Cube and other puzzles that I've not heard of. Um, and these puzzles are obviously complex, and complex complexity theory is what he does. So he's going to give us a flavor into the world of these complex puzzles. And I don't know what hanging pictures has to do with Rubik's Cubes. I have not the faintest clue. Uh, but he has a very interesting title. So over to you, Ram Prasad. You might want to share your screen and get started off. Um, I will then mute myself. Just but before that, I'd like to remind all of those who are watching us that, uh, uh, remember this is online, but we would like to make it interactive. So if you're watching us on YouTube, please put your questions, comments, and answers to the questions we're gonna ask you. We're gonna ask you to solve some puzzles with us. So put those answers in the chat box in uh, YouTube. If you're watching on Facebook, put it in the comments or chats or whatever it's called on Facebook. Uh, we would like to find out uh, and do some of these puzzles with you. So. I hope people have heard about the Rubik's Cube. That's going to be coming up in a bit. I think there are some other puzzles before that. Hanging pictures. Okay, hanging pictures and Rubik's Cube. Anyway, uh, over to you, Ram Prasad. Uh, and uh, uh, let's get started. So, so uh, am I audible? Is the screen visible, etc.? 
uh yes youtube audience please tell us facebook audience please tell us if you can hear us and if things are audible etc uh the only way we know is through your comments so keep them coming okay okay uh let's start uh so uh thank you for the introduction and uh welcome to this time why i mean this is going to be a, a sort of a a weird experience for me because i would have loved to give this talk in an interactive fashion where people can maybe play around with a physical cube and stuff like that but we'll make do with uh, the situation at hand so today i'm going to be talking about these weird things which are called commutators um it's it's some concept in mathematics it shows up at a lot of places and it also shows up in physics etc but i mean i want to introduce this concept primarily via a bunch of puzzles uh, uh just to get a flavor of things so that i can then tell you where else it is used in mathematics and so on uh so the puzzles that we are going to be seeing today are of uh, here are a few puzzles that uh, some of you may have seen some of them uh, so the one on the left uh, this is i think it's often called the 15 puzzle so it's basically a square grid where there are like 15 pieces with one hole uh, and the idea is that you know you want to use this hole to sort of slide pieces if you want and uh, i mean that's how you play around with this thing and probably something that is more familiar to most of you is the rubik's uh, cube class of puzzles so there are cubes of different types like for example this is a like what is called a pocket cube and this is the standard rubik's cube and then there are larger and larger cubes uh, sometimes there are these sort of weird looking cubes uh, that are there where you sort of turn along the diagonals and stuff um, these are all some kinds of puzzles that you play around with and something at least i was not familiar with was something this is a puzzle which is called oval track or it's sometimes also called top spin uh and all of these puzzles have the following uh, rough feature basically the thing is you have a certain object and you're allowed to move around these objects in certain restricted ways like for example on a rubik's cube or something what you're allowed to do is turn the faces and that's how you create more and more uh, i mean patterns and stuff so in the oval track there are two sorts of moves you can do either you can move all the pieces across i mean along the track or if you can manage to fit four pieces inside this uh, the central region you can rotate that four those four pieces alone so in this case if you complete the rotation the 1 2 3 and 4 are going to get shuffled they're going to get reversed so these are the sequences these are the sort of moves that you can do and the goal in all these puzzles is that there is something that we call a solved state like the final position or something and you are trying to get to that point so in the rubik's cube you are trying to get to a completely solved rubik's cube uh, and in the 15 puzzle you are trying to get to numbers that look like 1 2 3 4 etc etc uh and and so on and this in general these in general class of puzzles are called combination puzzles they show up a lot in mathematics when you try to understand uh, fields such as group theory and so on but we will not get to that we'll let's just focus on puzzles because puzzles are fun okay so what we are going to do is to introduce this concept of commutators and the commutators are super super useful if you want to solve the rubik's cube or any of these sort of puzzles on your own um uh, and it's not going to give you the best possible solution or the quickest solution but in my opinion it's the most fun solution you can have for a cube because you do everything from scratch okay and i'm going to introduce these commutators via some i don't know picture hanging puzzles uh, we'll, we'll get to that soon and really i want to basically say that this is a cool concept in mathematics and that's what i want to introduce since this is the chain by close to mathematics day and i will confess that this entire talk is just an excuse to show that mathematics can be cool uh, it's just a way of introducing a particular concept through things which is perhaps something that uh, um uh, that everybody is familiar with and loves doing and so on okay so let's dive right in and let me tell you what the picture hanging puzzle is the picture hanging puzzle has to do a lot with uh, how to hang a picture okay so this is going to be my my picture and there's a nail on the wall and you are trying to hang a picture around the nail in such a way that it doesn't fall off okay and any sensible person will try to hang a picture something of this sort but we want to have more fun so things are more interesting when you have more than one nails on the wall so here is maybe a picture of how not to hang a picture 
it's just some complicated way in which you wrap this rope around these three nails it's not even clear by looking at this if is this going to stay is this going to fall off i mean it just seems like a big knot on these three uh, nails and so this is what we are going to try and play around with so just to make things a little simple we are going to focus on just having two nails as an appetizer so that we play around with what happens and we are going to try different ways in which uh, we hang pictures uh, using these two nails and we'll try out a few examples and we'll always keep the following three questions in mind so the first question is going to be will the picture stick okay will this is going to be a yes no question so the second question is going to be suppose i remove nail 1 will the picture continue to stay and the third question is going to be well if i kept nail 1 where it was but i remove nail 2 is the picture going to stay okay and these are three questions that we should try and solve uh, for all of these things so let's try out a few examples so suppose i hang the picture this way that is i just wrap it around both the uh, i mean both these nails well will the picture stay of course the answer is yes uh now what happens when you remove nail 1 well even if you remove nail 1 it still continues to go around nail 2 so the answer continues to be yes and this question is also yes okay so this was perhaps a little too easy so let's try something else suppose here is another way to hang the picture in this case the picture stays when it's around i mean if you don't do anything but you can't remove nail 1 in this case because the moment you remove nail 1 the picture falls off okay and uh, but on the other hand if you remove nail 2 nothing really happens so it's okay to remove nail 2 in this case but it's not okay to remove nail 1 okay uh and here is some other complicated way of uh, writing uh, putting this picture down and i mean you can maybe write on the chat or something like uh, what do you think is going to happen in let me give you maybe an interesting situation suppose i hang a picture this way so what do you think is going to happen uh, to this picture is this picture is, is the picture going to stay or is the picture going to fall off uh, i mean no even without removing any of the nails or maybe the picture sort of you know uh, stays when you remove nail 1 but not when you remove nail 2 or maybe it removes when you it falls when you remove either of them etc etc i mean you could give your answer on chat i'm sure some of uh, somebody here will monitor it and Uh, and and see what the, I mean what you guys think about this um uh, maybe I'll just wait for a little bit okay people are saying that the picture will stay uh but what happens when you remove nail 1 uh good if you remove nail 1 also nail 1 the picture continues to stay but uh, if you remove nail 2 then the picture will drop off right because if nail 2 is removed then this is really some string that sort of looks like this i mean it's just wrapping around for no reason okay great so here is the picture hanging person you have two nails and you want to hang the picture over these two nails with the following two conditions the first condition is that the picture should not fall off okay the second condition is that no matter which nail you remove i want the picture to fall off Okay, I hope the question is clear. Uh, so this is what uh, we want to ask: like, how do you how do you do this? How do you hang the picture around these two nails such that the picture does not fall off as is, but no matter which nail you remove, the picture falls off. Okay, and if you have already seen this puzzle or something, maybe you can think about well, what happens if there are three nails instead of two nails, or maybe there are ten nails. and you can invent your own sort of questions in this case and ask okay can you answer those questions etc etc uh okay uh, again you can you can try and write on chat what do you think uh, if you have a solution to this but I mean, but here is a thing to begin with right even if someone wants to tell me that okay here is how you hang the picture around the wall i mean around these two nails how are you even going to write this on chat so maybe the first thing we need to do is to give names to what these loops look like like if somebody draws a loop around these two nails then what is the name like how do i say this is the loop i drew and to help do this we are going to sort of create these two guidelines like pointing upwards from either of the two nails 
and we're going to use these two guidelines to tell us what the name of these loops are going to be. Okay, and this is how I'm going to name a loop. Every time I go around a nail, around nail one clockwise, by which I mean it, it cuts this line from the left to the right. Then I will write down an A, but if it cuts from left, from right to left instead, I will write down A inverse. And similarly, if it goes around nail two, I will write a B and uh, otherwise I will write a B inverse, okay? So let's try out a few things. So suppose I, this is my yeah, I guess there are some questions. Uh, what did you say? You'll write A and A what? A inverse. A, there's a minus one on top. So, okay. Uh, can, you just write, can you just write that down on screen that it is A and a minus one on oh. top? I mean, A inverse. Oh, okay. So it's not I mean, that visible? Uh, uh, no, okay. no. Uh, yeah, so, it's, also, it's probably uh, just write it with your pen in big, maybe. Sure, sure. Because, so uh, yeah, we'll write so we, we A. So we know that we do have even seven standard kids in this program. So we're watching. Okay. Or if you want to think you know of this, just think of it as an A prime or just, we just put a mark to indicate that we are going in the opposite direction. Okay. So let's okay. maybe just try out a few examples and we'll just get comfortable with this. Thing. So suppose I draw a loop like this. Now, what is the name of this going to be? Let's start from here. I first went clockwise around loop A. So I'm going to write down A here. Let's continue from that point onwards. And I go anti-clockwise or I go in this direction around B. So I write B and I put a minus one on top just to indicate that, you know, I went in the other direction. So this is going to be the name for the loop that we, that we just Okay. Uh, good, let's try out a few other examples. Uh, so here is another, suppose I do, this is not even, hang. it's not going to hang at all, it's going to fall off. But let's write down, what is the name of this loop? So I start from here. So the first thing I do is I write a name. And let's continue, I write a B. And then I write a B inverse or B prime. And then I write an A inverse or A prime. So it's going to be A, B, B, and then you put a minus one on top just to indicate you went in the other direction. And then you put a minus one on top to indicate that you went to the other direction. Okay. Now this is sort of indicating that, you know, maybe, you know, if I'm, if I'm going around this mail and coming back immediately, well, what's the point of doing that in the first place? I mean, instead of doing this, I could have might as well just done this and nothing would have changed. So in some sense, it's indicating that maybe whenever you see a B and a B inverse right next to each other, you can cancel it off. And now you notice that A and A inverse are right next to each other and you cancel it off. So these are some, some sort of, you can, you know, you can try and make this, whatever name you wrote down for the loop, you can try to simplify the name whenever uh, it's possible. Uh, and so this seems to say that, okay, here is a sort of a, you know, like, if, like if you want to know when will a picture fall off, all we need to do is the following. Let's write down its name and see if it cancels off completely. That is whenever you see an A and an A inverse next to each other, you remove that and B and B inverse, you remove that. So let's, uh, let's just try out maybe a few examples. So suppose it was something like this, okay. The name of this loop is going to be, I first do A and then I do A inverse, right? So this name of this loop is going to be A and A inverse. And the rule says that whenever you see A and A inverse right next to each other, you can just erase both of them. Let's erase both of them. So I want to say that the picture will fall off if it so happens that the name completely cancels off. So let's try out a few other examples uh, just to get comfortable with this thing. So this is a loop that we saw previously. So what's the name of this loop? So the name of this loop is going to be, uh, you start from here, you first do A, and then you continue, and then you're going to get B, and then you continue and then you're going to get A inverse. 
okay and right now i can't simplify this any further because there are no a and a inverse right next to each other so i can't cancel off anything etc etc uh but here is here's what happens you know what would happen if i remove the nail the second nail that's as good as getting rid of all the b's that are there okay so this is what i want to say on the right which is that if nail 1 is removed all you do is that you remove all the a's and if nail 2 is removed you remove all the b's this is what you're supposed to do it gives you a way of figuring out whether the picture will fall off or not okay maybe this is you now getting a little hairy but uh, maybe the next slide will sort of help you with a little bit let's just rephrase the picture hanging puzzle find the name of the loop that does not cancel off at all but when you ca it cancels off whenever you erase all the a's or you erase all the b's so what would be one example of, of such a loop okay um and maybe one such example at least the smallest thing i can think of is that let me write an a and i want to put an a inverse so that it cancels off but let me put something in the middle to prevent these two from cancelling off so i'm going to put a b here but to cancel this b off i'm going to put a b inverse so uh, now here yeah uh, hi friend so i think there's a question on youtube which is saying that if you go around a nail uh huh what are you going to name it so if i go around a nail like uh, this uh, no no like completely loop i think i think that's what they mean so like something like this i think that's what they mean ha huh, okay in this case let's uh, let's figure out what the name of this is going to be i first do an a and there is another a so the name of this loop will just be a a because i went around it in some sense i went around it twice okay so that's going to be the name of this loop uh so in this case the smallest name that does not cancel off but cancels off whenever you remove a, all a's or b's uh is this this is the loop that we drew and if you want you can you know this is what the loop looks like when you actually draw it uh i mean it's a lot of fun if you sort of you know take a piece of string like this and just take two fingers and figure out what happens with this loop so this is roughly what the the loops looks like and if i remove this nail i mean this finger from it it just drops off completely and you can try it with the other finger as well okay I mean you can you can play around with this just get more comfortable i mean it's a lot of fun to try out various examples uh, of uh, of of uh, of what else you can do with this and this is what a commutator is it's some expression that looks like a followed by a b followed by a a inverse a inverse just means you sort of undo something and b is like b inverse is like undo. so in words or in plain english it just refers to something where you first do something and then you do something else and then you undo the first thing and then you undo the second thing that is what a commutator is okay said something i have told you something about picture hanging puzzles etc and a lot of you might be thinking about a few questions at this point maybe some of you are wondering okay i did this for two nails so how do you do it for three nails or 10 nails something and uh, we'll do this right at the end uh, you can think about it uh, if you have thoughts you can write on chat etc uh, but probably most of you are wondering what's this all got to do with the rubik's cube i mean that's probably why you i mean that was your primary interest for coming here or something and instead i'm telling you something about picture hanging and who hangs pictures over nails like this uh and this is exactly what we're going to do next and maybe some of you are wondering well is this really maths or am i just you know playing around and having fun and the point is maths can be fun i mean maths is fun and if with the right uh, attitude and if you enjoy doing what you're doing i want to stress that it's just a bunch of puzzles that you're trying to solve okay without further ado so what we are now going to do is to get to the rubik's cube uh, so let me tell you a little bit of the history of the rubik's cube uh, it's probably a very very popular toy a lot of you uh, is there a question uh, yeah, i think uh, some people uh, did not follow the thing completely 
Oh. Uh, there's no specific question, so I'm not. Uh, okay, if there is a specific question, just oh. let me know and I'll, yeah. Okay. Uh, but in some sense, even if you don't follow that, I mean, hopefully the Rubik's Cube will make things a little easier uh, to get a sense of. And uh, if, if the question still persists, I'll get back to it. Okay. So the Rubik's Cube was actually invented by uh, Erno Rubik in around the 1970s, who was a professor of architecture. And this, there's a funny story behind the Rubik's Cube because the Rubik's Cube was not originally intended to be a puzzle at all. What Erno Rubik wanted to know was if he want to create a, an object like this, where each face sort of moves independently without things falling apart, what should the internal mechanism look like? Like, how do you build a cube of this sort? And Erno Rubik actually had some wooden blocks that were sort of you know, tied together with rubber bands that allowed this sort of motion. And he was interested in the structural problem. Okay. Uh, but uh, he noticed that, you know, when the faces were painted and even after a few moves, the screw, the cube got super scrambled. And then you were like, okay, how do I bring this back? And, and that's how the puzzle Rubik's cube developed. Uh, and uh, it got really, really popular in the seventies, but somehow around 82 or 83 or something, the craze seemed to die down in the sense that the sales for this toy dropped off and people almost forgot about it. Uh, and then suddenly in the 2000s, the speed cubing community took off. Like there were a lot of people who were trying to compete and sort of figure out who can solve the cube the fastest. Uh, you know, how quickly can you do it? You know, can you do it with one hand? Can you do it with legs? Can you do it blindfolded, et cetera, et cetera. And once the speed, communi speed cubing community took off, suddenly from the 2000s onwards, it's seen a massive resurgence. Um, and maybe some of you are wondering, you know, how quickly can people solve the cube? Well, the current world record for solving the cube is by Yu Sheng Du, and he did it in 3.47 seconds. Okay, so let me give you, uh, I mean, you can find a video of it, uh, of Yu Sheng Du's solve online, but I'm going to show you how Yu Sheng Du's solve works. Okay, so here is how he solved. He basically started solving the red face. Let's keep watching it from the bottom. So you can slowly see more and more red pieces seem to be falling in place. And then suddenly he finished the entire red face uh, now. And somehow this is the last that is left and he manages to finish all of this. But obviously this was not the speed in which he did it. It was probably more like uh, something like this. Maybe this is not even fast enough. And who knows, but that's uh, how Yu Sheng Du saw it. Uh, is Rubik's Cube. Okay. Uh, so, yeah. So, what we are going to do now, I mean, if I were physically present there, I would, uh, I mean, I would be showing you the Rubik's Cube and stuff like that. But, uh, but maybe let me take you through some personal journey because the Rubik's Cube is something that was very, very important. It had a very formative experience uh, uh, to me. And I was introduced to the Rubik's Cube by my uncle, Vivinay. Uh, who was a former professor at uh, IASC, but he's an entrepreneur and you know, he does a whole bunch of cool things. Like he current, he's a founder of a company called Ati Motors that does autonomous cargo vehicles and stuff like that. And he was the one who, who gave me a Rubik's Cube when I was uh, quite young. And this was the farthest I could get to the Rubik's Cube or rather how much I could solve of the Rubik's Cube. That is all I could do was do one face like what is called uh, just do the top layer in some sense. And there's a reason why I could not do much beyond that is primarily because once you get to a situation of this sort, you don't want to break up what you have already done. So you tell yourself, no, no, no. I mean, I've already solved this much. I don't want to mess up the cube anymore. So you only try to change, you know, move these two layers around. And there's nothing you can do with these two layers. So that's the reason why I was stuck at this point. And maybe a lot of you are in a similar situation. Now, maybe we could just ask a poll from people as to how far you have gotten in the Rubik's Cube, if you have tried before. Uh, and uh, so that you know, we'll just get a sense of how, you know, what the audience is like, and then uh, and hopefully the talk today helps you. Uh, okay, so, so 
my uncle could have just told me okay here is how you solve the cube here is this uh, you know if you are in this position you do this move you are in that position you do that move etc etc but it would have been just boring i mean i would have known how to solve the cube but that's about it but my uncle did something which was much 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 better uh, so he said no let's sit down and let's try to figure out how to solve the cube on our own okay and how do you do something of this sort well he said okay we know how to solve one layer let's do one thing let's destroy whatever we have done okay and try to get back the top layer again in some manner so all we are going to do is we're going to mess up the cube but we'll keep notes and we'll see exactly what we did in order to solve in order to mess it up and then we'll resolve it again again we will keep notes we will keep track of exactly what is the sequence of moves that we did to put it back in shape okay and you're like wondering okay how is this going to help i mean i know how to solve one layer and that's about it i'm not doing anything else. so here's what happened so we messed up once and then we put it back again and we ended up in a very similar situation but then if you look a little more carefully you notice that it's not exactly what we started off with like for instance it looks like this piece used to be some yellow piece here but instead now it's a red piece there used to be a red yellow stuff here and instead now it's a yellow and blue stuff so some pieces seem to have moved around so you seem to have figured out a sequence of moves that i mean if you kept track of notes carefully you now have a sequence of moves that doesn't alter the top face at all but that's something useful with all the other pieces okay and then you notice hey we made progress so what we did that that month was basically sat down wrote down a whole bunch of these trial and errors to figure out which piece goes where etc etc and then put together and we could finally solve the cube and it was a fantastic experience because it was not something that i i thought we could do on our own but this experience taught me that uh, anyway so this was what happened when i was uh, far younger and fast forward to after me joining tifr in the process i have learned some mathematics i was taught this concept called commutators and i forgot about it until i met a student in tifr whose name is nikhil mande uh, who among other things is extremely interested in the rubik's cube uh, and the moment i mentioned something about commutators he was like he got super excited and he said oh yeah commutators are awesome and i was curious and he said uh, that oh commutators are something that i use a lot and in fact nikhil mande there was a point when nikhil mande had the world record or no the national record uh for solving 13 cubes blindfolded in under an hour and apparently whenever he solves the cube blindfolded or even when he solves the cube in general commutators show up a lot and this was i mean here is something here is a here is a topic that i had learned a long time back uh in completely different contexts and suddenly you notice that you know oh these commutators can be used to solve the rubik's cube like for instance i told you what the commutator is in the context of some picture hanging puzzles now how are we supposed to use that to solve the rubik's cube and hopefully today's talk will take you through this journey and a greater uh, sort of point i want to make is here like you know this is what much of research is like uh so i mean in the sense that you know often you are with you are faced with certain problems and you are trying to solve them but if you enjoy this process of trying to discover a solution on your own then it becomes it almost becomes a puzzle that you are trying to solve i mean that's really just the difference between a problem and a puzzle it's just that the puzzle is fun okay and so if you enjoy this general experience of trying to find solutions on your own then anything can be made into a puzzle uh and none of these solutions come in a single day it requires painstaking work slowly carefully writing down notes etc etc and all you try to do is make a little bit of progress at every every few days and once you make a little bit of progress you can put together all this progress that you have made and it will get you closer and closer to where you want to reach uh and finally i should also say that you know you should be patient and keep an open mind because you never know where these sort of new ideas are going to come from uh like for instance we will see this later or something maybe some of you have seen this sort of equation in high school when it comes to quadratic equations i got to know about commutators more from this context and i had no clue that this could be used for solving the rubik's cube and uh, so therefore i mean like you never know where this sort of 
you know cool connections are going to come from and we need to keep an open idea i mean open mind to uh, look for these opportunities okay so here's what we are going to do we are going to now uh, sort of i'll first start off by saying what the stock is meant to do and what the stock is not uh, supposed to do uh, so i don't want to just teach you to solve the rubik's cube if this is what you're interested in there are like plenty of youtube tutorials online where you know in about 10 minutes or something they will tell you exactly what needs to be done but i hope to do something which is better than that i hope to tell you that you know a solution to the rubik's cube is something that you can find on your own and this is like you know i want you to take you through the journey that i went through that summer that i spent with my uncle and i feel this journey is a lot more important than just knowing how to solve the rubik's cube i mean it's it teaches you the fact that these are things that you can discover on your own it changes you as a person uh okay so this is what i want to do so what we are going to do is we are going to go around with the cube a little bit uh so i mean if i were physically present with you i would have just shown you the cube and you know uh, you would have played around with it physically but we are not there so instead we are going to use <clears throat> some website uh, that was developed uh, called uh, this algebra.cubic.net but uh, uh, i mean maybe prerna if you can just share the the other link that i sent to you which just has a bunch of demos that i plan to use today in case the audience wants to play around with uh, with it i mean with those things themselves yeah okay I'll, I'll okay great thanks uh okay so let's uh, do that so the first thing we want to do whenever we have a cube of this sort is to just inspect and get comfortable with this cube now let's try and under let's, let's try and get a sense of what is this cube made of is there a question uh, um, Arthur, so is, there is, a question? is the link uh, yeah yeah are we putting the link up on youtube and facebook has it been put up already uh, yes pre preferably uh, yeah because that way people can uh, go to your website and also look at it themselves on screen yeah yeah exactly so that would be very very uh, yeah yeah and maybe you could just put up the, you can also maybe put up the website once again so people can just type it in or something like that uh, uh, so uh, prerna have you put it already uh, on facebook okay okay great okay cool so okay so let's look at this cube a bit more so currently it looks like okay there are there are like nine uh, squares on each side so and there are six sides overall so it looks so there are 54 such uh, uh, sort of squares that are there but really i mean the cube is sort of made up of pieces right i mean there is these are this is like a corner piece and there is an edge piece there is a center piece etc so let's keep that in mind so cube is made up of like like eight corners this is the white blue orange corner and this is the orange blue and yellow corner and this is the i mean the blue red and yellow corner etc etc so there are eight corners overall and then there are pieces that have just two colors on them like this blue and orange piece in the middle we'll call them edges okay and so there are 12 edges there are four here four in the middle and four below and then there are six centers the centers are just the center of each of these faces okay now if you want to make notes and if you want to keep track of exactly what it is that we did at every step it is important that we develop some at least some way of writing down what did i do when i changed the cube so let's look at what this notation thing means okay so so we are going to label the faces so the green face is the front face the thing on top we'll call the up face the right face the back face sorry the left face etc etc so whenever we write an f it means that you move that face clockwise so what i did was just an f and that is like moving the face clockwise if i want to move the right face i type r which means that the right face goes clockwise and this is for up and if i want to move the left face that's clockwise and maybe you move the back face or the down face etc etc it's just a way of writing down exactly what you did so that you know if necessary you can just undo everything so on okay but now okay i told you how to move things clockwise but how do you move things in the other direction that is anti clockwise they want to reverse all of them so we'll put a sort of uh, a, a, like a quote or a dash on top of this f 
which we'll call prime. And we'll say F prime means that you move the thing anticlockwise. Similarly, R prime will mean that you move the right phase anticlockwise. And a prime will mean you move the up phase anticlockwise and so on. Or maybe you want to move, you know, move, uh, move a certain phase 180 degrees. You want to move it twice. In which case we'll do something like R2. So R2 means you move the right phase twice. Okay. And there are more and more things that you can do. Maybe you want to move just the middle layer or maybe the middle layer, you know, uh, like there or here. And they all have names, okay? You can just, uh, give it. or maybe you just want to rotate the cube. You don't want to move anything, but you just want to physically rotate the cube. So you do this, like this, and so on. So this is just, at least it gives us a way of saying if we mess up the cube, you know, on the side in some, in some way or something, it gives us a way of noting down exactly what we did. Okay, and this is going to be important because we'll then be able to put together stuff that we have learned. Uh, I know, is there a what exactly were X, Y, and Z and M, S? Uh, yeah, uh, so can you just repeat what is M, S, E, and X, Y, Z? Yeah. Okay. So M refers to so moving just the middle F, layer alone, and F S R refers to moving so the middle layer. On the F is the front. F is the front. So uh, right. In the okay. F I mean, is the just front. Because this is, I think, important. So maybe, yeah. Yeah. So F refers to front. Okay. R ahead. refers yeah, to yeah. the right, and uh, and so on. And this M S N E, even if you don't remember, it's okay. Uh, but it's just I just wanted to tell you that you know there are ways to write this down. Uh, anyway, if uh, since the link is available on the chat, I mean, you know, feel free to play around with this. I mean, you can enter whatever you want here, and it will tell you what the move does. Uh, Okay, and X, Y, Z are like physically, physically switching the cube, like like turning the cube around, like rotating the cube in the Y direction or rotating it in X. Like three different ways in which you could rotate the cube, and you just write that down. Okay. Okay. So at least right now we know how to name things. We we know how to take notes, and uh, then let's move on to the next step. So the next thing we want to do is. Suppose I tell you a sequence of moves that I did. So let me tell you what is the sequence of moves that I did. It's written here on the right hand side. I did right, and then I did up, and then I did front anti-clockwise, okay? And then I did a down clockwise, and then I rotated the cube properly. So this was just some sequence of moves that I have performed. And the first thing we need to get comfortable with, suppose I want to undo whatever I did. How am I supposed to undo that? Okay. And so the last thing I did in the cube was rotating the cube this way. So if I want to undo, that's the first thing I should undo. Right? So therefore, the first thing you do here is you write X prime. That undoes whatever was the, the last move that we did. The next move that we did before that was the D. And I need to undo that. So let's write a D prime. And the next move I did there was a, the front went anti-clockwise. So to undo that, I need to move that clockwise. So I put an F. And then I have to undo the, uh, the up move. And then I undo the right. And great, we have sort of, sort of got the cube. So let's just go over this uh, completely. So this was the sequence of uh, sequence of moves that we had done. We had first done right, up, front anti-clockwise, down anti-clockwise, sorry, down clockwise, and we rotated the cube. Uh, there is a question. Uh, yeah, sure. Is it mathematically equivalent to start from a solved cube and work backwards to all possible starting states? I yes. assume it's like- Yeah, because yeah, anything that we do here, we can always reverse the sequence of moves. Uh, so, uh, I mean, so everything that we are doing, I mean, what I'm trying to, uh, in fact, the, the thing that we are presenting right now is just that once you write down a sequence of moves, you can always reverse everything. So. You can think of starting from a scramble and going to a solved state as instead as starting from a solved state and going to a scramble. 
if that helps thinking about uh, this. Okay. Uh, so this was the sequence of moves that we did. So in order to undo this, we first rotated the cube back and then we undid each of the moves that we had done earlier, but in the reverse direction. Okay. So this should tell us if somebody gave you a sequence of moves and said, how do you undo this sequence of moves? And here is what you do. You just start from the rightmost character or the last move that you did, go backwards and undo each move separately. Okay, so at least right now we know how to do things and how to undo things. Well, if I know how to do things and undo things, we should be able to do a commutator. Because all a commutator is, is you do something, do something else, undo the first thing, undo the second thing. So let's look at one example. Okay, so I'm just going to expand it to make it a little easier to follow. Uh, so here is the two things that I'm going to do are turn right and turn up. So let's first turn right, turn up, and then undo the right move and undo the up move. Okay, this is just some sequence of moves. It does something to the cube. I have no idea what it's doing, uh, but we'll, we'll sort of you know uncover the mysteries shortly. And this is what is called a commutator. And it's also convenient to write it in the notation that we that we had earlier, which is you put a sorry you put a square bracket right at the beginning, uh, and then you put a you put a comma between what are the two things that you want to do and undo. So and the square bracket r comma u refers to you do u, and then sorry you do r, and then you do u, and then you undo r, and then you undo u. Okay, it's just some way of playing around with uh, these things. This is what a commutator is. Okay, and again, you can, you can, if you want, you can uh, feel free to play around with uh, whatever is written here, and you can add more and more things. Maybe, you know, you sort of, uh, you, so you maybe do a do some other sequence of moves. You first do R, and the second sequence of moves is front down and up. So you do front down and up. And now you undo the first thing that you did, which is undo the R. And then you undo front down up, which will mean you have to do all of them in reverse. So you do up prime, down prime, and front prime. Anyway, this is some this is something that you can do. At the moment, it's not even clear why this is even useful. Okay, but we'll slowly get there. Uh, so let's go back. And so the main message I want to pass on today is the following which is that I'm hoping that uh, a lot of you, uh, you know, are probably familiar with how to solve the, just the top layer of the queue. Uh, and if not, I will, I will tell you how to solve the top layer of this queue. And what I want to say is that if you know how to solve one layer, that is what I mean by that is you should be able to take any piece and put it in the top layer without disturbing anything else. Okay, so if you have a situation of uh, this sort, that is everything in the top layer is done except this one corner. You should be able to put this corner in this place without disturbing any of the other pieces. If you can do this, I claim that you can actually learn how to solve the cube completely on your own. You can figure out your own way of trying to solve the cube just using this knowledge and with a little bit of help from commutators. Okay. So I do not know how many people here are familiar with solving the top layer or something. So I'm going to teach you that. Yeah, uh, Prerna, you had a question. Yeah, yeah, there was a question. When you were doing that R U thing, uh, uh -huh. I think for that, the question is, should we not undo U first? No, no, we are not trying to undo. We are trying to do what, uh, I mean, we are trying to build this commutator here. So the commutator actually undoes things in the wrong order. So that's what a commutator does. I mean, if you wanted to undo R and U, you would have first undone U prime. I mean, you would have you would have first undid the U part, and then, I mean, you would have then undoed the the R part. But the commutator does this in the wrong order. But doing it in the wrong order is going to be helpful. Okay. So I hope uh, uh, I hope that uh, clears up for you. 
Okay, so let's first try to learn how to solve the cube. Just the just the top layer alone. We are not going to try and do more at this point. Okay, so let's say this is the situation that uh, we are in. That is almost the entire of the top layer seems to be solved, except this one corner is in a different place. Okay, that corner is at the bottom right now, and I want to insert that corner on top without messing up whatever else is happening. Okay. Uh, so there are two ways to do this. I don't know what people are more familiar with, uh, but let me tell you both the ways and whichever you're most, uh, it's more comfortable to you, you can try and do this, or maybe you can figure out your own new way of doing it. So if the two pieces on top were not there, this is what I would have liked to do. But the problem with this is that, you know, it knocks off those two white pieces that used to be there on top. So let's not do that immediately. So what we'll do is the two pieces that got knocked off, let's preserve them by moving them away. So you first move those two layers on the back. You move them away from whatever you're doing, then lift the piece that you wanted to lift, and then move those two layers back. Okay, this is one way to try and solve the cube. Let's just go over this again. Uh, okay, so you first move those two pieces away and then lift this piece into its place. And then you move those two pieces back. And this is a very familiar sort of motif that you will try to do whenever you try to solve the top layer. You want to do something, it messes up a bunch of things, so you change the order. Okay, so that's one way of doing it. There is a different way of also doing it, which I call the conveyor belt model, which is like, we'll move this piece out of the way, bring this conveyor belt down, put it back in its place, and then take this out. And if you notice what is the sequence of moves that we did, we did something that looks like D prime, R prime, D and R. And hey, that looks like a commutator. So commutators do seem to be somehow useful. And we'll try and see how else we can do this. So similarly, we can do the same thing for an edge. That is, if I want to insert this edge piece on top, what I would have liked to do is do this. But again, it messes up these two pieces. So let's instead not do that. Let's bring that back. So let's first preserve those two pieces by moving them away from the what you're doing, then lift it in place, and then move those two pieces back. Okay. So hopefully this is enough information for most people to figure out how to solve the top layer alone. Okay. Uh, so let's proceed. Okay, maybe this is something that a lot of people could do anyway, but what's the use of just solving the top layer? I want to solve the whole cube. And in order to solve the whole cube, what would we really, really want? We would want to find some sequence of moves that moves very few pieces around. Because if I have a lot of pieces already solved, I don't want to mess those up. I just want to move a few pieces of them, move a few of these pieces around. Okay, and this is precisely what commutators are going to do. So what we are going to do is we are going to take two sequences that we already know of, try to see what their commutator does. And often this commutator is going to be super, super useful. Okay, and we'll just use these sort of commutators to build it. So to just get a bit more comfortable about this, I'm going to sort of think of commutators where I'm going to take two piece, two sequences that don't, that don't move any common piece. Like let's make life simple and let's just say that, you know, I have eight pieces that I'm moving in some way. Okay, and let's, there are two going, there are going to be two sequences, one on the left and one on the right, and we'll just see what their commutator does. Okay, so the first sequence is just some sequence that happens to shuffle pieces one, two, three, and four. So one seems to go here, three seems to go here, but it doesn't seem to change any of the bottom four pieces. Okay, and the one on the right is going to be something that only does something to the bottom four pieces, but that doesn't do anything to the rest of the, the top four. Okay, these are just two sequences, let's say we have. You know, and notice that sequence one only moves pieces one, two, three, and four. And sequence two only moves the bottom four pieces. So they don't have any common piece that they are moving. Okay. And if I were to undo sequence one, what should I do? I should just exactly flip if four was going to this guy, now that guy has, has to go back to the fourth place. So undoing sequence one refers to some bunch of arrows of this sort. 
And similarly, undoing sequence two is like you mirror whatever is written here, you just write it in the other. Okay, now let's ask ourselves, what will a commutator do? So let's, what is a commutator of sequence one and sequence two? You first apply sequence one, you get to some position of this sort, and then you apply sequence two, you get to some weird shuffling of all these eight pieces in some way. And suppose you undo sequence one, you get something, and then you undo sequence two, and then you get back to what you started. Well, what happened here? The fact that there was a sequence two in the middle did not really change anything about what happens to four, three, and two. So therefore, if I focus on just what happens on the top four pieces, it just looks like I applied sequence one, I undid sequence one. Well, obviously nothing will change. And similarly, here I applied sequence two, I undid sequence two. So this is an example where the, we know we came up with some complicated sequences involving, you know, like moving a few pieces around there, a few pieces around here, and we put them together and nothing happened. So it was utterly useless. But let's try to do something. Suppose the two sequences that we have have one piece in common. What happens then? So let's hear, here is an example. This is sequence one. And this is the inverse of sequence one, or it is how what happens if you undo sequence one. And the right-hand side is going to have sequence two. And this is what happens when you undo sequence two. Okay. Now notice that this row seems to be something that is altered by both sequence one and sequence two. So let's just pay attention to the numbers that are here. There is a five, there is a five, there is a two, and there is an eight. So these are the three numbers that seem to show up. Okay, now let's see what happens to the commutator. I have some sequence. So let's first apply sequence one. Okay, and then we'll apply sequence two and then we'll undo sequence one because that's what a commutator does. This is the order in which you do things. And then you undo sequence two. Now what happens here? Aha, so something seems to be happening. Everything seemed to get to its original location except for these three pieces, which is piece number eight, piece number two, and piece number five. And if you recall, these were the pieces that used to be there in the middle row in the previous example that we had. Okay. Okay, so something interesting is happening here. So here is in some sense what is called the theorem about commutators is that whenever you have two sequences that have exactly one common piece that they are moving. I don't care what sequence one does to the rest of the stuff. And I don't care what sequence two does to the rest of the rest of the pieces. All I care about is that together, I mean, I mean, that the common pieces that the pieces that both of them are moving, there is only one piece that both of them are moving. Okay, then the only the three piece, the following three pieces will change in the commutator. The common piece, whatever got moved to the common piece by sequence one, and whatever got moved to the common piece by sequence two. And these, the common piece earlier used to be five. So this was a five. Whatever got moved to sequence one was the two, and this was the eight. Okay, at this point, you might be wondering, like, what is going on? I don't understand any of this. So let's try this on the Rubik's Cube. Okay, so here is a Rubik's Cube. And let's say you have some sequence of moves that results in the Rubik's Cube becoming like this. That is, I don't care what it does on the bottom, uh, on the bottom two layers, but as far as the top layer is concerned, I want it to change only the corner. I want everything else to be intact. Okay, and suppose you have sequence two, which only changes the corner. I mean, think of this as just you're rotating the up face 90 degrees or something. So it doesn't change the bottom two layers of the cube, it only changes the top layer. Okay, now what are the pieces that both of them move in common? They move only this corner piece in common because this guy only changes the top layer and among the top layer, the first sequence only changes the corner. So there is a single piece that is moved by both of them in common. And now the previous thing says, what will this commutator do? It will move only three or fewer pieces. And these are the sort of sequence you often look for when you're almost solved the cube or 
you know you've already solved one layer and you want to make progress you're looking for sequences of moves that move that move very few pieces around and it's hard to find these sequences but i'm going to tell you that if you just if you already know how to do the first part and the second part you can automatically find sequences of this so let's try let's try out some examples to to see this in action okay uh, so good okay so i want to come up with some sequence that knocks off just the white green red corner that's all i want to do. i don't care what it does to the rest of the cube from the top layer i wanted to knock off that that corner alone so there are many ways of doing it here is just one you can come up with your own favorite way of doing this so here is one way you bring the right face down knock that corner off bring back the right face okay now this is my sequence one now let's figure out what happens if we take a commutator of this with the up face okay so i'm going to just make the edit here let's put a bracket comma and then let's do up look at that almost the entire cube seems to get back in place except for three pieces that seem to be moving around okay and if you are sort of uncomfortable like what is this commutator thing we can sort of expand and see exactly what happens so we did right down prime right that was sequence 1 now we execute sequence 2 which is up and now we undo sequence 1 which is right prime down right and then we undid the up which was up prime okay and the sort of difficult moves you may have been looking for where you almost you know you change very few pieces around but you leave most of the cube untouched this is the sort of sequences that you would want and you just built such a sequence using a commutator okay let's try to do the same thing for edges okay suppose i want a sequence that changes only three edges we'll do exactly the same thing let's first come up with a sequence that only changes one edge from the top layer that's all i want to do okay again there are many ways of doing it probably the simplest is just let's bring this middle layer down knock that edge out and then take this middle layer back up maybe you have a different way of doing it and it doesn't matter i mean there are plenty of ways of achieving exactly the same thing okay and uh, what happens if you take a commutator of this guy with up again only three edges move okay and so i mean so again you can sort of expand this out and see exactly what is the sequence of moves that we did we brought the middle layer down and then we knocked that corner off took it back up this was sequence 1 then we execute sequence 2 which is just turning the up face and then we just undid whatever we had done for sequence 1 and then we undid the up again and you end up with this beautiful sequence of moves that only results in three pieces moving okay okay great and you and i really should you know invite you to try it out on the cube and on the online thing and come up with your own sequence of moves and see what happens when you take the commutator okay let's let's try a few more things i mean okay so let's try to do this thing where we'll try to change this corner but we'll put it back in its own place but we'll put it back in the wrong wrong orientation so what do i mean by that so let's first take this corner away from there okay so right now that corner has gone somewhere here and i'm going to try and put it back into the same place but i will put it back in the in the i mean put it back wrongly in some sense okay so i'm going to instead put it back this way okay if you know how to solve just one layer this is something that you should be able to do through any of the methods that you use or i mean you can figure out your own way of just twisting one corner at the top it does something nonsensical for the bottom two layers but who cares about that 
we don't care all we care about is that as far as the top layer is concerned that is the only piece i want to move okay now what is the commutator of this is going to look like it just changes two pieces on the queue okay and in fact here is a corner what is this corner supposed to be it's supposed to be a white green red corner and it is a white green red corner but it is sort of twisted in place and similarly this corner is supposed to be a white blue red corner and it is where it is but it's a, it's just twisted in place so you've just now magically come up with your own favorite sequence of moves that achieves twisting to adjacent corners okay and if you expand it this is what the sequence of moves looks like it looks like a complicated sequence of moves but you know how you got it it's just a commutator of something that you all you, you knew how to write down with the up face and you can play around with your own favorite sequence of moves and figure out how to do this and uh, you know maybe you have your own i mean you have a different way of achieving this particular way of twisting these two things and you can ask yourself if i wanted to twist two corners what am i supposed to do and just play around with this and you will get more and more ways of doing exactly the same thing okay so i hope this thing just demystifies uh, you know many of these weird sequences of moves that you may have seen uh, because they are all sort of built using commutators in some nice way uh, okay and as an exercise you can ask yourself if i wanted to flip two edges what am i supposed to do think about it yourself try it out yourself if you want the edge flip button on the bot i hear that uh, in this for chi and y place has a solution to this but you should really try and come up with a solution on your own and ask yourself uh, you know uh, maybe you know maybe that's a cooler way of doing this than what i have in mind okay so so hopefully uh, what all this tries and convince you is that uh, oh uh, my screen sharing stopped uh, okay so can someone confirm if the screen sharing is back uh, yeah it's back okay great so now what you should be able to do is that you now can find your own favorite sequence of moves that moves just three corners and you can find your own sequence of moves that moves three edges but maybe they are not in the right orientation maybe the edges is flipped and so on but doesn't matter you all you can also find your own sequence of moves that flips two corners and you can find your own sequence of moves that flips two edges and if you sit down and you carefully put these sequences together you can solve the cube on your own okay it's not real it's not rocket science i mean like you know all you just need to carefully write down the sequences of moves that you did build the commutators using you know the, the sort of examples that we saw today and you can solve the cube and this is not something that is special to just the rubik's cube you can try to do this for these weird cubes or the 15 puzzle the oval track etc etc commutators are super super used okay uh yeah so this is this is what i wanted to tell you about the rubik's cube but i'm now going to tell you how i came across commutators uh in the beginning and this has absolutely nothing to do with the rubik's cube but i was surprised to learn that this actually has to do with the rubik's cube i thought so now i'm going to move away from the rubik's cube and tell you about more of mathematics and where commutators show up uh people who are interested can read more about this uh, i hope to at least kindle your curiosity with these things okay so here are some other places where commutators show up okay so some of you in high school may have seen sort of you know you somebody gives you an equation of this sort let's say ax squared plus bx plus c equals 0 uh, a b and c are some numbers that are given to you and you solve for x what does x equal and uh, this is a formula that should be familiar to many of you in high school uh, which is that right from the time of the babylonians this was a formula that was known as to how to what does x equals it's some it's some expression it doesn't matter what this is but it's basically it's something in terms of a b and c 
it involves some square roots etc etc then nevertheless it's some expression now this happened in 2000 bc okay it's 4000 years back um, so an obvious next step is what do you do if somebody gave you a cubic equation and there's a lot of funny stories around this cubic equation but apparently around the 1500s this almost was like a contest you know people will put out saying okay here is here are 50 cubic equations the person who solves the most will be deemed and you know like a super clever person or maybe there is a prize money involved and people used to sort of you know people will post these cubic equations and other people will solve them etc etc and you get a lot of prestige this way uh some people i mean the ex- who exactly came up with the formula is unclear the multiple people involved they were all secretive about what the formula was because there was a lot of prestige involved but it's often attributed to del ferro or tartaglia and <clears throat> this happened somewhere around the 1500s and i'm going to write down tartaglia's formula but don't worry too much about it we'll never we'll not have to use it this is what that formula looks like so x equals something here there are some weird symbols what is this symbol well that symbol is this guy what is this symbol well that symbol is this something it doesn't matter what this is it's some complicated part but the only thing to take away at this point is that there is a way of writing down what does x equal you can write down an expression it could be a horrendous expression but nevertheless there is an expression to write this and this was discovered somewhere in the 1500s now what's the next question going to be well what about degree 4 equations and again this is called ferrari's formula nothing to do with the car uh, so ferrari was uh, cardano student uh, not mistaken uh, and about 40 years after tartaglia's formula and so on uh, ferrari's formula is, i mean i'm not going to even try and zoom this uh, but it's just some complicated expression for this and you might be wondering what am i going to do am i going to tell you what to do with degree 5 etc etc when is this going to stop and degree 5 was not solved for the next nearly 300 years okay and there was a reason why it could not be solved turns out it's impossible and abel and rufini said that there is no such expression you can write down involving square roots and divisions and etc etc for the degree 5 polynomial at all okay and the proof of abel and rufini builds on a remarkable piece of work by a french mathematician called ivariste galva so his last name is pronounced as galva and as you can see i mean he died at a very very young age uh, i mean his life his life story is actually uh, it, it, i mean it's so he's a remarkable person and this is sort of tragic life story um he was an excellent mathematician of course uh but he was also i mean in 18th and i mean in 1800s of france you know there was a lot of political um uh, there was a lot of political issues going on and uh, galva was a firebrand i mean he was someone who was a strong political activist uh and he ended up dying as a result of a duel uh where i mean you know, this is apparently how people used to settle disagreements at that point you know you will meet at a certain place with a gun and figure out uh, and so on and actually galva was shot and two days before he passed away he actually wrote down a letter to his mathematician friends with all the ideas that he had and saying that these are things that i think may be useful why don't you send it to the you know the popular mathematicians at that point and maybe they can you know come up with some uh, useful uh, things using these and why am i saying all this right now because the entirety of galva theory really boils down to commutators and i mean one might be wondering what the hell does equations of this sort have anything to do with the rubik's cube or the sort of things that we have been looking at but they do it's a surprising connection but it does so so here's another place where it shows up you may have seen these sort of high school geometry constructions where you know you're given a compass you're given a ruler and you're supposed you are asked to you know can you build an equilateral triangle can you build a square can you build a pentagon blah 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 and so on and maybe a lot of these things you did in school like how to build an equilateral triangle how to build a regular hexagon 
by regular i just mean all the sides are uh, are the same and it just you want to build an object that has a certain number of sides uh, with all sides being equal and some of this you know uh, the ruler and compass there are a few a, bit, a couple of them which are a bit more complicated this is the pentagon and the docker and the decagon uh, but turns out the other two which is building a regular heptagon which is a seven sided figure or a regular nonagon which is a nine sided figure it's just impossible with just a ruler and a compass you cannot build these things and again this uses galva theory and commutators play a huge role here it's not even clear commutators of what what are the things that are moving etc but uh, as i said all of them are puzzles in some form okay so let me sort of uh, summarize um, and so we did a few things we did things involving commutators finding solution to the rubik's cube but this was really not the point of uh, what i wanted to say i mean um, so the thing is the point of this is that doing science involves more than just finding answers to things i mean often you want to know i mean you don't just want to know what the answer to a certain question is you want to know why and it is this curiosity that you should try and somehow keep kindling all the time and the journey to finding this answer is often very very fulfilling now like i mentioned earlier i mean no i mean the the experience i had with my uncle that one month where i spent trying to when we figured out a solution to the rubik's cube on my own um, so it's something that does more to you than just telling you what the solution to the rubik's cube is because it was an important lesson at that point because as a 10 year old or something of that sort i would have told i would have never believed that this is something i could do on my own but the fact that my uncle helped me go through this journey it 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 made huge it made a huge impact on what happened there on because it changes you as a person it suddenly makes you feel like oh this is something i can do too okay and this sort of translates must beyond you know just puzzles or anything so for instance if somebody told you at a later point that you know the moon is a, about 400 km 400000 kilometers away from earth okay what am i supposed to do with that piece of information okay we shouldn't be satisfied with just what this piece of information is we should want to know how do you know that this is the distance how did you find this out and the difference that this does is that if someone just told you the moon is this much away from this the 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 result that it does to me it's like it tells me oh that person seems to know what the answer is but when you ask the question of how do you know this or how how can i figure this out too that's like you are trying to shine a spotlight on the scientist inside you it makes you aspire to be something more than what you thought you were capable of it was like oh i this is something that i could figure out myself as well and that's really the point of this curiosity okay and something that i'll also say is that you know like the difference really between problems and puzzles is the fact that you want to somehow make problems fun and but it might seem like you know what is the point of taking all this effort to try and write down what is the sequence of moves that you did etc cetera, etc cetera. but there is the there is there is sort of the the effort the painstaking effort that you put in in noting down these silly moves it pays dividends at the end i mean at the end when you discover for yourself that you somehow miraculously came up with a sequence of moves that just moves three pieces around i mean it sort of gives you a smile i mean it gives you this joy that it's sort of you know it makes the whole the meticulous effort that you put in completely worthwhile and once you have a few experiences of this sort you will be able to enjoy even other efforts that you put in with respect to any career in research or anything of that sort as long as you enjoy doing what you're doing anything can be made to look like a puzzle and you will just have fun trying to i mean in this experience of trying to solve this and then i lend by saying that you know i mean always keep an eye out for completely strange connections because you never know where these sort of new ideas are going to come from or what's going to give this inspiration that you're looking for and really nature can really really surprise you i mean who would have thunk that you know the fact that like a regular seven sided figure cannot be constructed using a compass and a ruler has something to do with how a person solves a rubik's cube i mean why would you think these two are related at all but somehow they are and one should be open to these things and that's all i wanted to say maybe some of you are still wondering what to do with three names 
and I'll leave this animation in mind and with a hint here for you to figure out on your own. Uh, that's it. Yeah, thank you very much. Were there any questions? Thanks, Ram Prasad. Thank you so much. And uh, let's see if there are any questions. Uh, Prerona, are you going to see if there are any questions on uh, um, the chat or on Facebook? Yeah. or? Yeah, yeah. So there was one question uh, a while back. They asked, mm -hmm. uh, can you define a topology on the Rubik's Cube? Uh, uh, so almost. So the so okay so the all these sort of loops that we had in mind uh, around these nails and so on the study of these uh, sort of objects and study of space in general is uh, belongs to this field of subfield of mathematics called topology uh, and topology is something that is very closely related to a different field called group theory uh, and I'm, I'm maybe throwing some bunch of words here but the point is the reason the Rubik's cube is so it's such an awesome tool for people who work in math. Know. Sorry? Oh, sorry. Uh, I'm... So, so the Rubik's Cube, the reason Rubik's Cube is like a super good uh, example for a lot of people who work in math is that the group associated with the Rubik's Cube is super important. The set of symmetries, like what are the sort of things you can do with the Rubik's Cube is very, very important. And it's, it's, it is related to topology in the sense that as we saw, commutators show up at both these places, but the relation is a little more subtle. Uh, are there other things? Uh, yeah, okay, I can also it. check the. Uh, so I think someone asked, uh, what is the fastest sequence that solves on a Rubik's cube? Uh, if I remember correctly, uh, it is known that from any scramble, you can get to the solved position in 20 moves. What we do, did today is nothing close to the fastest solution. It's not the most efficient solution by any means, but in my opinion, it's the most fun to do because it's something that you are doing from scratch and you can find your own nice sequence of moves and so on. And even people who may be familiar with the Rubik's Cube algorithms, I mean, you memorized a whole bunch of sequences that you use generally, you can maybe now go and look back at those and ask yourself how many of those were actually commutators in disguise. Uh, and maybe that will also be fun to try out. Yeah. Uh, I also don't see many other uh, questions. There is a question. Is there a short algorithm for two by two Rubik's cube? This is... Actually, yeah, two by two. I don't know what is the shortest sequence of moves to solve the two by two. Uh, uh, I don't have a guess for this, but yeah, it certainly is going to be shorter than the three by three. Uh, and by the way, whatever we did today, you can also do this on a two by two. I mean, in fact, you can do this on any of these combination puzzles. Uh, as long as you can find a pair of two moves that move only one common piece, you can use that for any of these puzzles. It's a fun thing to try out. Okay, so what are the, okay. I can't see the Facebook chat. So is there anything there? Uh, no, no, nothing there. Okay, so. Okay, so in, in that case, uh, maybe we should just look at the uh, wrap up of what's coming up. Um, uh, Surendra, will you just show that? Sure, sure. let me just uh, stop sharing screen then. Sorry, just an, another question came. Uh, sure. Is the construction of heptagon impossible? Uh, yes, it is. I mean, if you want to construct it only using a straight edge and a compass, this can't be done. Uh, I mean, I presume what the question is like a regular heptagon. That is a regular, a seven-sided figure where all sides are the same length. And it's impossible to do this. Yeah, there's a Y also, but I'm guessing. Uh, yeah, so um, I mean, why is uh, it, it goes through <laughs> this Galba theory, which is sort of hard to describe on a chai and why? Uh, I mean, actually, maybe you can try. I mean, look up on uh, Wikipedia or something of that sort. Uh, it's 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 a it's one of these like sort of hallmark achievements of 
the work of galva uh, it tells you exactly what n-gons can be constructed and what n-gons can't be constructed seven is the smallest one that can't be done Uh, maybe I'll write that on chat. Uh, okay, it's not letting me paste a link. Uh, you want to uh, go over what comes next? Uh, fine. So, okay, just a minute. I'll get the announcements. Yeah. So, uh, starting 3rd of January 2021, we shall be back at Prithvi Theatre as usual and we will be online as well for those people who cannot make it to Prithvi Theatre, remain connected to uh, with us on the YouTube as well as on the Facebook. Uh, after that, uh, most important things happening this week is the great conjunction of Jupiter and Saturn and you can see see approximately for about 30 minutes or so after the local sunset look out look at the west sky towards the left side and you will be able to see the jupiter and saturn converging and this is the lifetime opportunity because it's happening after almost 300 years and will not happen for another 60 years or so so it's a good thing to see you can see the two planets along with the satellites of jupiter in this small field of view so don't forget to look at the sky for next three, four days. Today and tomorrow, possibly, they are going to be closest and then you will see this separation happening. Uh, 22nd happens to be Ramanujam's uh, birth anniversary and that is also celebrated as a National Mathematics Day throughout the country. So though Chai and Y hasn't organized anything, but there will be a lot of events available. So be on the lookout. You will have a lot of things to happen. Immediately the next day, we have a four o'clock session. This is for the uh, Homi Bhava Center for Science Education students, but you also it's all can six, join. 6 p.m. 6 p.m. 6 p.m. Sorry. Thanks for correction. And it's available on the YouTube. We will try and post it on our Chai and Y page as well, event page as well. Uh, well, please be connected uh, with us on the Facebook at Chai and Y and Twitter at Chai and Y. And till we meet next time, be safe, remain safe. Save yourself and family from COVID. Thanks.